very excited for this. My talk today is on no excuses, product centricity. It's a cultured approach and a culture-centric approach to getting to become a product-centered organization. So who am I? Why would you care? It's a very reasonable question. Uh, my name is Jordan Cortland Brown. Um, I work, as you said, for ThoughtWorks. I work with clients. Uh, we usually do co-source engagements where we're at the client site. And the majority of the work that I'm doing in, that, in the course of that is lean product transformation. We work with clients who have a really strong desire to move further than where they are in their culture to become an organization that is more capable of behaving in product-centric ways. But often they're very big organizations, they're very large, and there's a lot of challenges with that. And those challenges and the patterns of behavior I've seen in the course of some successful, some not so successful transformations are kind of what shape the focus of this talk. So what have all those things taught me? Well, the first thing is that at its core, product centricity is really, really simple. The platonic ideal of it is really just a system by which we understand the space, we understand the market, and we try and understand the customer needs as best we can. We imagine interventions for that, which we create as potential solutions that we've designed. We run them through some sort of validation process to test whether or not our assumptions were true. We take those learnings, filter it through our metrics, and then we try it all over again, either scaling the first thing we tried or doing something different. So that's really simple. It's really easy. Everybody can do that. Great. Talk over, you can go home. The problem is that in the course of trying to build the right things, identifying the way that we build the right things, and as well, building them in the right way, people run into the problem of trying to evolve that, of course, an entire organization's culture. That's something that a few people in a small group can really easily pick up and do. But how do you manage that when you're in an organization that's very large, very new, or very behind in terms of product thinking? And so, it's important to think of product evolution as a long-term endeavor. Uh, a lot of organizations, you might work at one, I know I've worked with clients who are them, have a very truncated process whereby you have marketing and design, engineering, they're all doing the work, they're doing the thing that they've been hired to do every day, but they're very separated from each other. Some of them have moved a little bit beyond waterfall and are doing agile or safe or something along those, any of the flavors, but they're not yet a holistic organization where everybody is driving towards a vision and they all have shared ownership of it. So, Typically in an engagement, we'll start the evolution by identifying certain areas of high value that we can start transforming individual teams or groups within an organization to give them a greater understanding and comprehension of product centricity. Great, so you take those areas, you create that change, you also create new thought leaders within the organization who can then go and evangelize and start creating blended areas of the business where marketing and engineering and product are working much closer than they have in the past. In fact, the seams between those divisions are falling away. And what you're getting is already more effectiveness. You're taking customer information from marketing and putting it into play in terms of how you're shaping your product much faster and easier. That's a great shift. All the way up to an overall long-term goal of a complete holistic organizational transformation whereby everybody understands what our vision is. Everybody has shared pieces of ownership of it and they're working together collaboratively with all the skills and capabilities of the business being applied where they're best and most necessary to be applied. But the problem is, and the pattern we most run into, especially in the consulting space, is great. We all know this is wonderful. Lean product is the way to be delivering value with less waste, more effectively, more quickly. But someone's also read that in the Harvard Business Review. There's an executive who's seen that article and it's like, great, we need to go and change. And so the mandate comes down from on high, and the pattern we typically see is they send some product managers or some product leaders within their organization to trainings and conferences and to read books. Maybe they'll also bring in some new people, some other product managers, some consultants, like me. Uh, and we'll come in, and we've had success in the past, and we're going to bring that success and put it into play at your organization. And then we take all this new information and we wash it over a bunch of people across a whole organization, people with little exposure to product thinking, people with different ideas of what it should look like. And eventually, in the course of trying to complete the day-to-day -day work of an organization that has to be done, frustrations arise, challenges come through, and we find that the stumbles start turning into trips and then start turning into falls, and inevitably, there's some sort of massive failure. We have to get this thing out by January, and this whole new product thinking endeavor has just really gotten in the way of that. Let's just set it aside from now, we'll get back to it later, and we'll do what we're used to doing. So the failure happens, 
There's not a huge amount of reflection as to why it didn't work in the first place. And the boss says, never mind, we're keeping the status quo. We know how to do what we've been doing for a while. We're not out of business yet. Keep going. And that becomes an excuse that's set and it's concrete as to why people don't tackle the problem of doing product centricity. And fundamentally, it's because they're not understanding it as a problem of culture. And so what I'm going to be talking about is how do we view product centricity as a culture of design? Where I assume most of this room here is product people or designers, UX people. We're familiar with the process, whatever specific flavor of it that you do as a designer, that you do see yourself as a designer. But I also work with a lot of engineers, QAs, ops people, finance people, who do not consider themselves designers and do not think in a design-centric way. So how are we going to make this broad, long-term organizational change that's going to be successful? I'm going to argue that it's important to first start focusing on how do we do culture change. That isn't a mandate. That isn't something you've bought off the shelf and are plugging into your business. It's a human endeavor. So when I talk about culture, I'm talking about a few characteristics. The behaviors that people have, the values that shape their decision making, the norms, the patterns you see them operating by, communication, organization, politics as well, those aren't going to be the ones I'm going to be covering for this talk. They're for another day. Ooh, fun, those emojis changed. Um, but I want to talk about these three because I think they're the first foundational ones to understand. If you want to take the idea of all the amazing things you've been hearing here and put them into practice in an organization, whatever level of maturity yours is at, how can you start a grassroots change in culture that's going to facilitate a long-term holistic organizational change? That's why I'm focusing on culture and principles versus practices and techniques. You've heard a lot of great speakers here talking about a lot of really interesting and useful practices and techniques. Those are good. Learn those. Have those. But when you're introducing people like those ops, the devs, the engineers, when you're introducing the finance person who does not think like a designer to ways that you want them to become more feedback focused, more outcome focused, more flexible to change into shaping your organization to something that can deliver value better, you need to give them principles that they can work with. And the reason you want that is because principles are open-ended questions. If I take a list of best practices, like everyone's seen, I assume, like the standard scrum playbook of like, you do this, and you do this, and you do this, and that's how you do it, and you have to do all of them, or else you're doing scrum wrong. And it's like, well, there's a really quick checklist of things to say, I'm either am this or I'm not this. But if you look at things in terms of principles, ideals that you can shoot for, that you can put your workflow and the way that you do what you do as a lens, you can start to understand, okay, we're not perfect yet, and we may not be the best practice as it's outlined in the book, but we might be something that's closer. We're getting better at this. And so given a principle, you can ask yourself a question of how do we currently approach this principle if we aren't already doing it? How could we be better at this as opposed to do we or don't we do this practice as described? And I'm going to give you a playbook for this. And the playbook being not a series of steps that you're going to follow, but a series of principles, concepts, and ideas that you can take back with you, and you're the product person. You are a steward of product centricity as culture within your organization. You are not the manager of it. You are not the leader of it. The whole goal is that everyone is a leader. Everyone has shared ownership and accountability. How do you get them to understand their role as a designer, regardless of what it says on the, the role description they were hired from, but in how they can all contribute to creating a holistic organization that creates useful products? First is values. Why is prioritized before what and how? We're outcome focused. We care and we will talk first and only first about the purpose driving our mission, what we're going to do. The methods, the tools, the techniques we use, those all come later. An example of this might be you have low checkout conversion. The wrong way to approach this would be to say, well, PayPal would maybe, you know, we'll get a rise from PayPal. You've immediately jumped to the solution space, which would make Dan really sad, because you want to start in the problem space. So you're going to focus on the outcome that you want. What would good checkout experience look like? Well, how do we know that? We need to understand the customer's perspective on that first. So we're going to go ask them to get the why. Next would be 
outcomes prioritized over outputs. How many times have you seen a status update that says, our team has delivered 20 more stories than we did last week? What does that mean? Like, because uh, they could be 20 of the wrong stories. And that's the problem I typically see is, especially when you're dealing with a specific type of management who is focused on like results, but like results in that very MBA way, which means like, I want my numbers. But the question is, what numbers do we actually care about? So an example of this is, what did we accomplish in this sprint? Well, our velocity went up, we completed 10 more stories. Well, how about thinking about talking, what business value did we deliver? If you've already established really useful metrics that you're putting your work through as a lens, then you can really specifically talk about something that's valuable, as opposed to we did more than we did last time. Because more doesn't necessarily mean the right thing. Next, you would ask yourselves, how are we considering boundaries versus constraints? A core part of being product-centric is the fact that you have teams with autonomy. And each individual has autonomy within that team. Everybody has the ability to determine what is the best course of action given the outcome that I've been tasked with to own. So when I think about some of the project teams I've worked on, the question, are we working effectively, or are we writing good stories, has come down to, in a very management-focused, standards-focused organization that has constraints, they're saying, all the stories need to be written in JIRA, in this format, in this way, by this date, for this meeting, as opposed to saying, we have a physical and digital backlog, our stuff is there, the devs understand what the stories are, they can pick them up, they can move them quickly, and the whole team has a shared understanding of where this product is going. I don't care if it's in Jira, if it's in Mingle, if it's on stickies on a wall, the team is allowed, given boundaries that have been set, to say, we just need to know that you know what your, all your stories are and I can come and look at them. Great. You determine the method that works best for you as opposed to being super prescriptive about what they need to be doing. Next is, we prioritize better over perfect. This is a very simple concept, but one that I think often derails a lot of the conversations that teams have. There's always this assumption, whether it's the new feature or the scrum practice, like this is how you do a stand-up, that if we're not doing it in exactly the most ideal way, then we're doing it wrong. But also that if we're not doing this thing currently and there is an ideal way, the path and the gap between us and that ideal is so broad, we could never achieve it, so we'll never actually try. And that's the bigger problem. Because, and a perfect example might be, I work with a lot of organizations that actually have no design practice whatsoever, and they're bringing us in to be that product and design perspective. And they're not used to the idea of user testing. They've never done it. When we describe to them what it is, they'll say, well, we don't have a subscription to usertesting.com, and we don't have a setup relationship. We don't have all these other things in place. Whereas, uh, I was at a, a retail company in the United States, a uh, large fashion department store. We just started pulling people out of the stores in New York City, in Manhattan. We would go around and grab five people and say, do you have five minutes? And just do it. We did it with iPhone cameras. It was great. It was gorilla. It was fun. But at the same time, we didn't prevent that the idea that we don't have 50 users, they're not rep perfectly representative of our whole core demographic, we did the best we could with the infrastructure that was in place, knowing that it will refine itself as we go along. Behaviors. This is really important because the process of design when we talk about for features or for the product is the same type of thing we should be using on the behaviors of the team, the way that we do what we do every day. You go through a process of discovery, understanding that problem space. You identify areas to focus on first because they're high value and high opportunity. You prototype solutions that you're going to run through and validate. You measure the results of those experiments. And then you scale the successful ones into higher and greater successes. Great. Good for features, good for products. How are you using this same design process on all these things in your team? How are you using this same design process to make the way that you write stories more valuable? Are you doing the three musketeers method where you have VA, QA, XD, and they're sitting in a circle, and it happens once a week, 
twice a week, how well is that working? Do you know? Could you be writing better stories? The reason to think of this principle and put it into place is because as opposed to trying the stuff out on a brand new product greenfield initiative, there's a much lower stakes way to get people on your team an understanding and a comprehension with these ideas that they get more comfortable and then they start evangelizing these things further out. So this process that we use to design our business model, our entire lean product value tree, is the same process you could define to how do we get snacks? Has anyone ever tried designing what way you're going to source within the team, snack preferences, purchase snacks, and have them there to eat? It's a really simple way to start getting used to this behavior. And you do it over and over and over until maturity grows, and then you can start throwing higher stakes, higher risk endeavors to them, to these people who have now grown this comprehension. Into norms. Nothing is absolute, everything is negotiable. This is a core tenet of Agile as well, but it's something that's worth reminding to ourselves in product is that we put together this whole huge strategy. It's on the wall, the execs had us print it out in beautiful glossy sheets that are 50 foot by 50 foot and they're posted up for everyone to see. Next week it is inevitably going to change. We cannot grow too attached to these things that we've set in place. And that's also down all the way to what time does stand-up happen? Well, we got new people on the team, and Susan and Gary just had a baby. So she can't get in at nine because they have other things going on that's interrupting the normal flow. How are we gonna change our stand-up time? It's as simple as designing a new method for that, just as much as it is the entire company strategy. Iterative design is hypothesis-driven. We're working with assumptions, and it's okay that these assumptions don't last forever. They can change. Everyone is a product owner, and everyone is a designer. This is especially important, not for you in the room, but for the people who aren't in this room on your teams. I work with so many engineers and developers who don't ever get offered the chance, the opportunity, to participate in sketching. They don't ever get offered the opportunity to take part in guerrilla marketing research, in ethnography, in observation of user testing, because they're supposed to be coding, because that's their way of being productive. But if they have a better understanding of the user, won't they also have a better understanding as a designer of code to create a better product? We want everybody to understand that they have a role to play in the ownership of this product, and it's not specifically the tasks they do all day, it's their input into how we shape not only the thing that we create, but the way that we create it. You design with the user. It's an important thing in these principles as you're going to start at grassroots to think of yourselves as the user, your team as the users. As much as is reasonable and possible, you bring those people, the beneficiaries of the work that you're doing, the people who you're trying to have an impact on, into the process. I did a project with a mortgage company in Texas where we were building a new sales tool for their sales team. We set up our team space after about three weeks. We moved it from a room they had stuck us in in like a basement corner and we put it right in the sales area. And whenever we had a really interesting question for, hey, what do you think about this idea we're working with? We just pulled someone from their desk. We became a part of their environment. We embedded ourselves with the users. You won't always be able to get that close to them, but how close are you trying to pull them? Thinking about better before perfect, how can you get even closer? How can you bridge that gap between the user and yourself? Measure everything. How do you know if your retros are useful? How do you know if this feature was good? You're creating these metrics. You're determining what we believe is valuable to ourselves given the information we have at the time. And also, as we keep going, we say, are these metrics still useful? Have we matured past them? Have we accomplished some of the things we knew we wanted to accomplish and then continue to move on to more ways that we can define a product that we're building? We also want to be autonomous, but at the same time accountable. You're giving those people on your team boundaries, free space that they get to operate within. You're allowing them the space to try things, to not be so good at things, to become really good at things. At the same time, you need to be accountable. Everything we do is in service of the outcome. At the same time, we should be able to have logged and available every decision we made and why we made it. We have the freedom to do what we believe is best for the team, 
but the we believe was best should come from some sort of research, some sort of analysis. Put that somewhere. So you allow people the space to try new things. At the same time, enforcing in a small amount of way to say, why did you make this decision? So we can also have maybe other teams learn from your process as well. Broadly, just to kind of close out, the reason I, I really wanted to talk about culture at a conference was because as a consultant, I'm like an interventionary. I'm flying into these businesses. Someday it might be yours and I might be sitting next to you all of a sudden with all this authority to tell you what's right, what's wrong. And it's a really fraught process. It makes people anxious and nervous. Change always does. But the thing that I love about being a product designer is that this process, the way that we do design, fundamentally gives people freedom. It gives people autonomy. It gives people ownership in a traditionally hierarchical corporate structures that we run into that don't, that are designed to be command and control, that are designed to tell you what you should and shouldn't do in the way that you have to do it. I think this stuff is important, and evangelizing this, creating grassroots culture where people develop an understanding and appreciation for these concepts, you're also freeing them. You're also creating a more democratic workspace where everybody has a voice and everybody has a say. So think when you go back about those developers you work with or about those ops people who have never gotten to be a part of the discussion about what we're creating. And think about how little stakes they already have. And then think, how can I give them more stakes? As the steward of product and design in my organization, how can I give people more freedom? That's it. Go forth. Make some culture.